please, but I'm sure we'll find that. The discussions are being led by Olivier Dieters from the Dutch Impact Focused Fund uh, of Triple Jump, and I'll hand it over to him to introduce his members of the panel. Thank you, Olivier. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Richard. Thank you so much. Um, well, I would say to everyone, uh, uh, w w uh, please be welcomed here to um, arguably maybe the most interesting session of, uh, of the conference. <laughs> Um, my name is Olivier, thank you uh, Richard, um, but enough about myself. Today it's about uh, investing into SME companies in Africa. Today it's about the panel and it's also about the audience. And maybe somebody can close that door please, that would be very thankful. Um, as we're having a, a conference about, uh, well, about Africa, I would actually say to the, to the panel, Karibu Sana, and I would ask the panel, Habari Yako. Missouri. Missouri Sana. Thank you very much. Um, this panel is, uh, yeah, I would say very astute and a very distin distinguished panelist. So I would again welcome Vim, Mike, Michael, Shrivar and Kaylee. Um, now I'll, I'll keep it short in terms of introductions. Um, so we have Shrivar here. Uh, Shrivar is an investment principal at Edge Growth Ventures, a South African SME development specialist and impact investor. Um, we have uh, Michael uh, Akampa, he's a chairman of uh, Traction Capital, a Sweden-based investment company active in emerging and frontier markets. We have Kayleen. Uh, Kayleen has a very long resume, but uh, I will keep it short. Uh, Kayleen uh, yeah, has 25 experience, uh, years of experience in impact investing. Uh, um, is a global and technical specialist um, in impact investing access to finance for SMEs, general lens, investing and risk management. On top of that, uh, over 10 years ago, Kayleen started her own consulting company called Athena uh, Global. Um, then there is uh, Mike, Mike Mompi uh, from Enza Capital. Uh, Enza Capital is a venture fund investing in early stage African technology companies solving large and meaningful problems. So that sounds very interesting. And last but not least, we have uh, Wim, a uh, fellow Dutchman, but more importantly, uh, Wim is the founder and managing partner of Goodwell Investments. Uh, and Goodwell Investments is an uh, investment firm focused on financial inclusion and inclusive growth. So again, thank you all very much uh, for being here. Um, maybe just about the structure. Um, yeah, this is about investment opportunities and challenges uh, in, in investing in companies in Africa. So I thought let's first talk about the challenges, then the opportunities, and then see if there are any, any commonalities and especially if we can identify, um, well, of course, the opportunities, but also how can we overcome those challenges. Um, I've also asked the panel to maybe take into account the current macroeconomic environment. It's always interesting to look at the institutional or the company itself, but today, you know, the world has changed, so maybe we can also take that into account. Um, and finally, and then I will be quiet, I was thinking how to start uh, this panel, and um, yeah, thinking about gender neutrality, I thought it's always easy to start with women, but you know what? Let us look at the alphabet, and then who's the first? Well, then you end up with Kayleen, so I would say indeed ladies first, so Kayleen, the floor is all yours. Thank you. So I, I just want to start off. I think there's probably three main challenges that I see in the MSME investing space in Africa. At a high level, the first is that there's 54 countries in Africa. It's not a single market. And the solutions that the MSMEs face are local solutions, right? It's not a one-size-fits-all model. That gets to the macroeconomics, right? Each country has its own dynamic, whether it's Ethiopia and political instability, or Nigeria and FX instability. So I think if you're looking at the MSME space, it's, more, it's even more important to understand the market in which you're operating, the context in which you're operating, and the unique challenges that each MSME faces. The second challenge that I see is inappropriate financial instruments. Because, uh, so we have invest in early stage ventures, so unsecured lending between 50 and 150,000 US dollars. And I think um, so many of the instruments that are appropriate for larger sized investments, whether you define that as S or N, or N 
are inappropriate because I see a lot of forced valuations in early stage companies that are premature and full of bias and inappropriate to value a company at that, that level. And so everything that we do has both a gender and a climate lens. And so I also see a lot of founders taking early stage dilutive funding that pushes out the founder way too soon. And I think it's a, it's a power dynamic play that we'd, like, that we'd like to change. I also think that there's too much focus on just debt or equity or just funds. We are an impact finance company, we're not a fund. So I think there needs to be more innovation and more acceptance of different types of financial intermediaries and instruments. And the third thing that I'll say, and then I'll, I'll leave it to the rest of the men on the panel, is that I think too many investors are focused on the packaging of the deal, right? They want everything packaged in a pretty little box with a pretty little bow, and it ticks all their compliance boxes, and it's very, very comfortable for them. But I think the world is a messy place, and Africa, like I said, is 54 countries. And I think we really need investors, especially the DFIs and the donors and the founders coming in, the foundations coming into the impact investing space to be focused on the outcomes, whether that's a financial outcome or an impact uh, outcome or a social outcome. We need to be focused on the outcome and let the companies help us figure out how to get there. We can't control the entire process, right? And so I think for me, that's, that's we've doubled down on that under COVID, but I don't think the DFIs, the donors, and the private investors have caught up with that, that the investment, like you can't control everything about the investment. So let's stop focusing on the packaging and focusing on the outcomes that we want for Africa and for the investors. Thank you, uh, Kayleen. Give it up. Yes. Thank you. Shrivar, can I ask you? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Olivia. Um, I think from, from our side, you know, we've, we've pretty much been focused on SME investing in South Africa. I mean, that's our main focus area. We're looking to expand now, but I think my, our sort of perspectives and insights will mainly come from, from South Africa. And what we see in SA, well, there's one major macro trend that we're seeing at the moment. Um, Obviously, here in, in Europe, there's, a, there's an energy crisis. In South Africa, we have our very own energy crisis, and that's cause, causing a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues and adding a lot of pressure to, to small businesses in general there. We see that um, the supply chain constraints and as well as uh, inflation across the board essentially adding a lot, of, uh, a lot of margin pressure and squeeze to small businesses across the board. Uh, and then in addition to that, um, just things such as businesses not being ready, uh, investor ready. We see a lot of businesses that come to us um, with poor financials, uh, they haven't gone through uh, their sort of decks clearly, they haven't completed their, their presentations properly. They come to us, yeah, in a very sort of unprepared, unprepared state, and which makes it very difficult to invest at that point. Um, but what we are seeing is that on the equity side, in early stage ventures, a lot of businesses that have managed to, to go through accelerators um, and get that sort, of, uh, that sort of support have come to us with uh, much better preparation and pitches, etc. And that's helped a lot. So I think what we're seeing in terms of collaboration in the space with accelerators is helping a lot, especially on the early stage side. But with later stage uh, or more mature SMEs in traditional industries, we still find it very challenging to receive the sort of information that we really need to, you know, to assess these businesses and make investments. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Michael. Thank you, thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Shreva. I think I realize um, a lot from what my um, fellow panelists have, have talked about, uh, but I'd like to come at it from a different perspective. And from our perspective, uh, being a global platform that tries to mobilize capital to, to Africa is the first challenge that most SMEs face is um, the African penalty. So the fact that you're an African SME trying to raise capital um, cuts off a lot of investors. It's uh, the many investors globally that don't understand the challenges that you go through. And because of that, you struggle to, to sort of defend the continent and defend the opportunities that you have. The second that sort of ties into what Shiva talked about is uh, lack of capacity. So we see that uh, traditional industries, traditional sectors that are not tech focused, they don't have access to the same resources, the same accelerators as sort of help in early stages. 
and when they go to raise, they really lack capacity to present the business case, to present their impact case. And then lastly, it's um, networks. Um, many of the SMEs we've seen worked with they have very limited networks. Uh, there's a handful of investors that they're able to reach, and they're not able to reach international investors, and even if they did, they would struggle one from um, the African penalty, that they're African companies, that it's too high risk, it's too hard to understand the business model, and also not well presented. So I think from our perspective, that's what we see as some of the most overreaching uh, challenges. Okay, thank you, Michael. Maybe uh, we go to uh, Vim, please. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> So I think it's, um, uh, it's not a one-dimensional sort of uh, complexity that we're facing. And, uh, and, and so I, I don't want to give the impression that if, if sort of some of the things I mentioned can be resolved and then sort of the floodgates are open, because that's mm -hmm. not going to be the case. But there are some particular challenges that I see for investing in, in SMEs in Africa that, um, that, we've, that, that are very particular for Africa as well. And, uh, but they are, they are sort of based on what you see happening across emerging markets. And the first one is at the level of the, the SMEs themselves, uh, similar to what, what, what uh, Michael was saying, the networks, the ecosystem around those SMEs is actually not always there. And, and most of the time it is actually is not there. And that means that even if a business itself is, is, is viable, it, it, is, it is for lack of an ecosystem around it that it is struggling. And, and so just putting funding in actually doesn't resolve that problem. The funding needs to come with some, some support for the ecosystem or some funding into the ecosystem to enable the SME to, 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 to grow or to use the money uh, in, in a useful way. And we see that at the level of, of SMEs, the more traditional mom and pop SMEs that, that are sort of the ones that are typically what you talk about when you're talking about SME funding. Uh, and we also see that especially with the fast growing SMEs, which is the area that we specialize in, uh, the ones that, that have the, the sort of the, the possibility of, of scaling exponentially, um, quite 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 often, of course, tech tech enabled, and that, that are the ones that actually uh, just really need to have a solid ecosystem around it, because a lot of the uh, money that's invested in those SMEs actually is invested on the assumption that there will be rapid growth, that it will not just be like the working capital uh, loans. Like, and, and I fully agree with what you're saying, Kaylin, is, is that that indeed you shouldn't focus too much on the instruments and the way that, that sort of it's structured. But, but at the end of the day, it does make a difference whether the, the funding goes into financing a working capital or the, the growth of an SME along an, an, a linear uh, track, or whether it goes into an SME that, or a small business that is financed because it, it is going to realize exponential returns and, or exponential growth. And those, that exponential growth needs, uh, uh, if, uh, places even more demands on the quality of that ecosystem around it. And it's actually, on the one hand, it's, it's a challenge. At the other, on the other hand, of course, because there's always a, a flip side to that coin, it's the opportunity. It's the opportunity to actually create something that wasn't there in, the, in an ecosystem that's not there, and therefore it enables you also to leapfrog or to, or to, to leap into an, uh, 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 an infrastructure, create an infrastructure that didn't exist. But it actually requires from the investor making that investment to actually not only do the due diligence on the SME itself and understanding the business model of the SME, but also understanding the ecosystem around the SME to, to, to evaluate whether that is an ecosystem that is able to grow with the company or that the company is able to grow its ecosystem. Okay. Thank you, Vin. Mike, uh, anything you want to add in terms of challenges, please? Yeah, so I think it's been laid out very, very well by uh, fellow panelists. Um, I would kind of almost counter, I think a lot of S African SMEs, I think they're, they're businesses, right? Smart individuals, great teams, great plans. Um, and it's less about the SMEs, it's more about the context that they're operating within. So it's the uh, infrastructure, it's the access to talent. Um, so I think when we're backing businesses, and this is coming from the lens of someone who's also backing high growth, uh, technology enabled and technology driven businesses um, is, is that they have to work harder, right? They have to grind harder, uh, perhaps for less of a market. So even in Nigeria, you know, many people look at the Nigerian opportunity over 200 million people as a massive market, but it's less than, uh, less than 2 million households that make over $10,000 kind of household income. So discretionary cash is actually quite low 
you still have to compete with the Googles, the Microsofts, and the Twitters who are setting up local offices uh, for that talent. And because you know, in COVID, we had a shift of talent, so where you can have someone who's based in Lagos working for a company in New York or San Francisco, it's completely changed that game, where I think a lot of people early into the African market as investors were saying, look, it's going to be cheaper, um, you know, low-cost talent, high potential. Um, but I think one of the big challenges is, 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 is talent, really, and how talent is changing on the continent, uh, which is fantastic for individuals who maybe didn't, uh, who weren't born in, in uh, you know, the right place uh, because they're getting opportunity. But I think for a lot of small and growing businesses, it's going to be very challenging on the talent front. I think anyone here who sits on a board or has a lot of positions in high growth African companies, you'll see that if you ask the founder what is their biggest challenge, it's talent. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. So I, I think maybe before going into the opportunities, because I do hear a sort of common de denominator about, which I, I recognize about Africa, right? No, you know, about the ecosystem, no network, no, no financials, et cetera, et cetera. Is there anything else? I know some of you already tapped into that, but how can we, or how, well, we, how can this be overcome, this specific challenge? Is there anyone that wants to add a little bit more to that? Not having the ecosystem and be talking about maybe technical assistance, I don't know. But. Yes, it is what you need, you need a blended approach. So technical assistance, uh, the, uh, it, of course, is the, the, the common sort of denominator for that. But it's beyond technical assistance, it's also actually uh, ha having sort of a sense of collaboration among investors and among everybody who's, who's involved in, in supporting and, and building the ecosystem to actually see that everybody's working in the same direction and that there is that collaborative approach. And, and, and there's also still a lot of, as it, as it's, it's also predictable because this is an immature ecosystem. Um, we're still only at the, at the, sort of, at the start of a, of a, of a journey uh, in many ways for the ecosystem. And, and logically, the gaps that are still there, there will be people seeing that, identifying it, and, and, and stepping into those gaps. But, but that's what's really needed now, is actually some, some way of collaboration that actually those gaps are identified and, and plugged earlier, than, and, 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 and so that you can resolve it. Like on the talent side, there are a lot of initiatives to help grow the African talent. Uh, on the, in the tech side, but also in the financial uh, side. Uh, and it's actually up to all of us also around the table and mm -hmm. here in the audience to see what we can do to contribute to those kind of initiatives. Um, and not just only focus on, in a silo on what, what your um, um, portfolio of activities is. Anyone else wants to add or shall we talk about opportunities? I, but I, I could add uh, something please. I think around uh, another specific challenge that we touched on and that we see a lot is uh, particularly in early stage uh, ventures on the earlier journey, uh, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of need for capacity, there's a lot of need for more investors to, to work more earlier stage because that's also a stage where most companies die, where they get a lot of, in, you know, messy capital tables, where they get investors that are not going to help them grow or scale or that don't understand the, the problem they're having. And also collaboration that uh, Vim is talking about in, at that stage to catalyze more you know, companies, more fast growing companies to support some markets that, um, that uh, are lagging behind others or that don't have a critical mass of, uh, in terms of market size. So I would think particular interventions at an early stage could also make, make a difference. Can I add one more major challenge? Um, and you know, everyone, when people talk about possibly investing in Africa, the first thing an LP or, or, or someone who's going to kind of move money onto the continent says, well, what about currency? Um, which is fair in some ways and also unfair because, as you said, 54 countries, idiosyncratic risks. You have the Francophone region that's pegged to the euro. Completely different challenges on the currency there. Um, however, most of the capital that we're investing, at least it's, it's in dollars. Um, and, you know, Investing 50 years ago, a million dollars, right, into a Nigerian company, flipping that into Naira, they would have had to grow 13x just to return a million dollars to get 1x. And, and that's tough. That is very, very difficult. And a lot of businesses, when it comes to access to finance as well, are raising balance sheets to provide access to liquidity. And those entrepreneurs, again, need to work so much harder. Right? They need to build not just a business that works, that returns some cash so they increase their net income. They need to like, grow like a rocket ship, like a Silicon Valley firm, like the, the, the lady who's making chapati right? you know, on the corner in a, in a cabanda. 
to then return that cost of capital to that business who needs to charge high enough for that net interest margin to return it in dollars. So what's a solution? Local, you know, local currency debt, for example, or if there are people who have more flexible capital, then how do you maybe create a subordinated tranche to de-risk you know, or, or take that currency risk to unlock more commercial capital? Um, but I, currency is also such a major, uh, a major risk that it's, it's going to get worse um, in the next few years before it gets better, and we'll see, we'll see that play out. No, that's a very fair point. Thanks, Mike. Let's uh, go about the uh, opportunities, uh, right? M maybe uh, I go back to you, Kayleen. Uh, so, uh, yeah, can you elaborate a little bit on where you see the opportunities, please? Yeah, I think for me, I see t two major opportunities. One is er early stage ventures, right? Because although I appreciate the role of private equity venture capital, a business has to hustle a hell of a lot to be able to take on a million dollar investment, right? And so we need more financiers, we need more ecosystem support in that gap between microfinance and where private equity or venture capital might come in, right? Because that's sort of the valley of doom for MSMEs, right? And, and I also think that we need to stop pretending that private equity venture capital is the be all, vendor, be all and end all of any founder, right? That all they want is this path to an IPO. There's a, there's a lot of really good businesses providing really good jobs for normal people, and that is what we need in Africa, right? We need a sustainable and a resilient middle class. The second thing I will say, and I feel compelled to say this as the only woman on the panel, is that we need more investments in women. Because, you know, there's this misconception that a woman founded business in Africa is, you know, she's got a, a basket on her head and a baby on her back, right? And that is wrong. When African women are founding businesses that are doing great things, women as leaders, women as founders, women as employees, and then also serving women as clients. And I think a lot of time we talk about empowering women, and I'm here to tell you, women are already empowered. We just need people to get out of our way, right? Mm. Women are not marginalized. <laughs> women are not marginalized, we're sidelined. And there is a difference, and I think we need to recognize that. Less than 7% of investment globally goes into women-owned businesses. It's less than 2% in Africa. So come on. Stop telling me there's not good investable pipeline of women-owned, women-led businesses. It's just not true. But you cannot look for women founders at a bar in downtown Nairobi at 8 o'clock on a Thursday night. That is not, that is not where the women are going to be hanging out. And so I think that we need to recognize and acknowledge that and I, I can tell you from my personal experience, I have absolutely no problem with pipeline. 88% of my portfolio is women-owned, women-led businesses or women in leadership positions, right? And I'm not saying that I'm perfect or I have a secret sauce, but I'm meeting the women where they are and I'm meeting the founders where they are. And looking for pipeline is not a desk job. And if you think it's a desk job, then you're in the wrong industry, especially in Africa. Pipeline is not a desk job. And so I think as investors, we really need to, to challenge the assumptions that we have in the industry. We need to take a step back and look at our bias, especially for those of us who are not of African descent. And we need to recognize that if we want to make a difference in Africa supporting MSMEs, we've got to meet them where they are today. Okay, thank you uh, for your passionate story. Thank you for that. No, uh, sure, can, sorry, go ahead. Just second <coughs> that, actually, because we... Uh, I just want to support you in, in, the, in this statement. Uh, we actually thought, thought we were doing pretty okay already. Uh, uh, I'm one of the few men, men in my organization, and also one of the few, uh, uh, although I'm African-born, not, not, not sort of, uh, didn't, didn't sort of work there my whole life. And, and we, we thought we were doing great in terms of our balance. We went through a, an exercise this last uh, year with value for women mm -hmm. to actually investigate our own biases because we already have a sort of above average uh, <coughs> number of, of, of female that uh, businesses in our portfolio but we don't want to be complacent about that and we actually wanted to be more intentional about how we do it and and so i just wanted to support you in, in, in what you're saying thank you it's, it is really sort of uh, direly needed in in our space uh, to have more focus on on those biases i support you as well oh, thank you <laughs> yeah. i feel very supportive <laughs> Yeah, I guess we all support you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no, thanks. And I think we can have another session on gender. Uh, there, there is one tomorrow. There is one, There's by the way. Having said that, there, there is one, so please check the agenda. Um,
back to the topic, opportunities, Shravar? Sure. Uh, Michael, do you want to say something first? Yeah, I just wanted to add on, I think, not just from the perspective of uh, you know, women-led ventures or uh, you know, balanced uh, governance and, uh, and, 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 and employees, but also from the perspective of what the business, the, the, the customer the business is serving. And there's a lot of good opportunities to businesses that are including women that are serving uh, more excluded segments of, of society. So I think that's also an opportunity in itself in looking at that how the services and products that the organization are developing and how they include a left out market. I just wanted to add that to that uh, I, I support you as well and yeah. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. Uh, yeah, full support as well. I think maybe just to add a little bit from, from our side, um, we, we're, we, our entire sort of uh, team at the, within Edge Growth Ventures uh, on the investment side, I think it's more than 50% female, and I think there's more than 30% that are in sort of senior decision makers that are female as well. And maybe just to build on, on the opportunity side, I think what we've seen is that well, we have a strong history in supporting underrepresented, uh, well, in South Africa, it would be known as previously disadvantaged founders and founding teams. And, and quite a large uh, portion of that are actually diverse, including female founders. Uh, and maybe just touching on one of the segments, sorry to sort of belabor the, the energy point, but uh, one of the fastest growing businesses in our portfolio is actually a green tech company, uh, a local lithium iron battery manufacturer that's actually co-founded by a female. Uh, entrepreneur and you know they've been doing really well um, and I think going forward uh, we continue to see energy security and especially using renewable uh, sort of uh, alternative uh, energy solutions and affordable ones uh, as a sector that that's going to be one that will transform uh, Africa so it's already it's already growing exponentially in South Africa that's just due to our our sort of issues back home uh, with regular power outages etc but I think going forward, uh, we're seeing you know, the sort of advent of uh, decentralized energy grids um, uh, and the like that, that are increasing uh, sort of the uh, security for energy. Uh, so I think on the one hand, sort of green tech. Uh, on the other hand, just general sort of green economy. So if you look outside of energy and you look at things like water conservation and management, sustainable agriculture, um, sustainable waste management, so things like recycling, etc. I think we're seeing a lot of great opportunities, not only from a, a, a green outcomes perspective, but also from a, from a job creation perspective. And I think also maybe just to, to build on what, uh, what Vim had mentioned around collaboration, um, we've been fortunate enough to be a part of uh, a, uh, an initiative called the Green Outcomes Fund, which actually is a public-private initiative that brings together a few different organizations, uh, such as the WWF and you see well, the University of Cape Town's um, Entrepreneurship Center that initially designed this initiative to incentivize local fund managers to invest in the green economy. So essentially investing in green SMMEs that, uh, that would uh, have some form of, uh, of green outcomes and, and in the process creating employment. So I think one of the main issues that we have in South Africa is, you know, very high levels of unemployment and especially youth unemployment. So I think the incentives to invest in the green economy are sort of a win-win for all because you're creating this incentive uh, through sort of grants by, for example, in the Green Outcomes Fund structure, we essentially have uh, a, a local grant provider that provides grants for each job that's created within the green economy. So that de-risks or improves the economics for, uh, for local investors. Uh, and for green SMEs, it's actually increasing the opportunity to raise finance. Um, and once again, if you add the gender lens or the, or the underrepresented lens to that, you're now increasing uh, inclusion uh, ac across the spectrum. So I think the green economy is one sector uh, and, and, and all other sorts of uh, technological uh, or tech technology enabled and focused companies that are improving access to things such as healthcare, education. I mean, FinTech, there's, a, there's sort of a lot of hype around that, but I think we feel there's a few other underserved areas, um, you know, as I mentioned, in health tech and, and even in things like marketplaces and platforms. So we were early investors in, in companies like Sweep South and, and Kandua, ones that create a lot of employment, uh, and I think you know, going forward, we see these as, as great sectors to continue investing in. Thanks. Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. yeah I, do, I would like to add, following on that, I think there's a huge opportunity for MSMEs in Africa with respect to um, funding climate change. I think there's been a, a decent amount of growth in the MSME sector of investors coming in to fund um, mitigative climate finance, but the adaptive climate space I think is still a huge opportunity, and I think it's one where Africa is very well positioned to lead in, lead the world in, because climate change is affecting Africa so prolifically and so rapidly. And so I, I would actually love to see more adaptive climate finance coming into the African context, because I think it's, um, it, it could be a game changer for Africa, but also position Africa as a role model for the rest of the world. Yeah. I'd like, I would also like to add something to that. I think from what we're doing at Investiture, we see that climate financing and particularly uh, supporting businesses that are creating, um, uh, that are sequestering carbon in Africa, whether it's uh, a collective of farmers that uh, is taking carbon, uh, that are sequestering um, um, carbon dioxide into, into the soils, or whether it's uh, renewable energy businesses that are sort of avoiding we see that um, being able to finance those businesses and to sort of certify the credits and offer them to uh, businesses elsewhere that are looking for good uh, projects, whether it's uh, avoidance or removal, could um, create a specific uh, opportunity for Africa to, to live in this space and to create really high quality projects. Mike? But, What's uh, the question? Uh, no, well, but, uh, and and about the opportunities, maybe you want to add on green or, or women or, or yeah, show well, us a different angle so when it comes to opportunities. I just want everyone on the panel to know that I support you all. Uh, <laughs> well, I, think we, I think we all support you. We're more equitable. We support you too. I mean, all, there's, there are obviously plenty of opportunities. Otherwise, none of us would, would be here. None of us would be spending our kind of lives and our... Uh, trusted relationships that we've been building and, and, and our capital uh, on, on actually uh, seeking out and supporting these opportunities. Um, I'll pick, I mean, the, on the finance side, right, this question on currency, it's, it's a big challenge. Um, so one of the things we think is a major opportunity, right, is not this kind of how do you build a mobile first digital uh, unsecured lender to get people access to cash that they can't actually pay back or when they pay back you're eating all of uh, any, any value that's been created from it, but how do you make it easier for people to save, right? Mm -hmm. And if you can drive local currency deposits, then you can build a real balance sheet and match that, um, match that asset to the liabilities, right? And, and that means that you're, rather than having to raise cash from elsewhere, you're, you're making it easier for people to, if you can make it easier for them to make money than to kind of save it, then you don't have that currency risk and currency exposure. And that's how most financial institutions work. So I think it's just applying some of that kind of smart technology in, in, in a slightly different way um, to, to, I think, mitigate that, uh, that currency risk. I mean, there's so many opportunities. I can talk forever. I don't know how much time we have. So I'd love to hear from someone like Vim, who's been thinking about this much longer than I have, uh, about the opportunities. Well, I, and I support you totally. So, oh. <laughs> Uh, so the so opportunities wonderful. that you see are the opportunities that we see, and we see them especially in that category that, that also uh, Shrivar mentioned in that inclusive space. So the um, uh, you know solving solving the problem for those people in that bar in Nairobi where you know you shouldn't be doing the deals anyway, is also not you know where the where the where you know the the, the biggest opportunity lies in terms of solving for their problems. Um, and uh, so we don't need to sort of invest in another food app for Nairobi or whatever to, 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 to change the face of, of Africa. Uh, uh, not that we want to change the face of Africa, but actually to look at the, the next opportunity in, 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 in creating sort of uh, something that, that is scalable and, and is meaningful to people in their daily lives. And actually, the, the, we are actually in a very fortunate circumstance that we are in the midst of a crisis. And it, that sounds very, uh, very nasty because actually the daily crisis in the in in the daily lives of people in Africa is very real, and 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 so I don't mean it in a, in a condescending way, but actually, what we are seeing is that people that are in that daily crisis and crisis is is the normal for them anyway, uh, regardless of whether there's a, an energy crisis in Europe or or an interest rate hike in in, in the U.S., their sort of reality was already uh, always like that that there is. Uh, uh, that there is a very of, of a lot of fluctuation in food prices and and, and 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 money is difficult to access and actually what we're seeing is that a lot of new business models and a new technologies and, and and solutions that are either technology driven or technology enabled 
that are actually addressing those mass market sort of uh, 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 big questions are actually getting more traction in times of crisis. And, and in that sense, you could, you could even say that, that some of, the, of these business models are actually a bit anti-fragile, uh, 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 which, which is a, uh, a beautiful concept that actually uh, talks about in times of crisis, which are the ones that are not just resilient, because you, you can have businesses that are crisis resilient and ones that are not, but you can also have businesses that actually become better because there is a crisis. And that's what we're seeing across, uh, and it's not just incidental examples, and we've seen that, for instance, in, in fintech, in the payment space, we saw the, 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 the growth of, of the more affordable uh, options uh, because cash was just too hard and, and, or harder in, in times of pandemic. And we're also seeing that now in, 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 in a lot of these business models, whether it's in mobility, logistics, in healthcare, that, that some of these more sort of uh, uh, scalable solutions are also the ones that are creating that affordability for people that are in, in that crisis. And that's, I think, where we see, we're going to see a huge shift also, and it's going to actually sort of push that, that uh, 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 what I mentioned earlier, that, that, that immature ecosystem that is still sort of in pockets, there are things happening, but it's not across the board, and it's not happening at the same level everywhere. We'll see more of that sort of convergence of those initiatives across, across the continent, and we'll see also more convergence of different uh, uh, activities within a country that suddenly start to sort of spark each other. And we see that in embedded finance, for instance, already in the agri-chains or in healthcare. And we see it with, with, uh, with ways that technologies are converging. And that's actually where I see a huge opportunity. Uh, also, not just in, in tech for tech's sake, because there's a lot of tech for tech's sake going on as well, uh, receiving a lot of attention, but it's actually where the tech meets the physical and where the click and mortar kind of models are starting to actually become more effective. That's where we see the, the, the biggest opportunity. Thank you, uh, Wim. Um, well, I think it's nearly about time, and everyone uh, mostly would like to go for lunch. But still, I would, I would ask the audience, of course, uh, let's, let's have a round of questions. So please, anyone. Hi there. I'd love to pick up on the subject of collaboration and um, female-led businesses and the big problem of talent. And I'd, I'd love to share the idea that we've done as an executive search firm. Our whole solution to, the, to finding scarce talent is sharing scarce talent. And what we have done now as an executive search firm has built a platform that allows businesses to have a top executive in their business by the hour or for a day or have a fractional CMO that's running their business, meaning that when the Googles come in and the Microsofts come in, they don't take the talent all for full time. They can possibly have them three days a week, and on a Thursday and a Friday, that talent gets shared elsewhere. So it would be wonderful to hear what you think of that idea, but obviously it's great to just put it out there. It's called Homecoming X. Thank, thank you, you for your question. <laughs> Indeed. Um, thank you for that question. Anyone uh, with a question? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds interesting. Somebody's coming. Thank you. I'm Dr. Chia Almona from Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And um, I, I always wonder about the gap between there's no money and we have plenty of money. So if I come to a gathering like this with a lot of investors interested in Africa, I then believe that there's some funds, a lot of funds available to invest in Africa. But then when I go back home, um, all most businesses, most small businesses, and a lot of my um, chamber members are saying they're looking for funds. So there is a gap somewhere. Um, and I, I think that sometimes the investors perhaps um, need to rethink the model because if you are expecting the small and medium-sized businesses to jump through a lot of hoops and hurdles to get the funds, then they're discouraged. And sometimes they do then get the funds, and then you are high maintenance because you're required to do so many things, report to you, and then they lose sight of the business. So I, I just think that um, as investors, it's important to um, perhaps establish the fact that sometimes, depending on the stage of the business, different perhaps governance model will be required or different funding packages will be required to make it easier for businesses in Africa to attract funding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the. Comment. Thank you for that remark. Thank you. Nice. Yeah. So, um, while you're talking about supporting, I was just wondering, what about supporting local fund manager businesses? Because you know, t ten years, twelve years ago, there was a big phase towards trying to build up local venture capital in country funds and do partnerships. 
Is that not something that's really important in countries like Tanzania and so on, where you can do much better as international investors working through a local fund manager? Yeah. Uh, can I just yeah. respond to that, or do we want to take multiple questions? Very, no, no, very please, quick, go ahead. Very quick response. I'm a local fund manager. I'm Ghanaian. Um, I sound Californian. That's because I was there for quite some time. Uh, and, and, you know, my whole team, there are only nine of us, but we're all Africans from across the continent. And we also, thinking about talent, we set up a venture fellowship program where we took half of our cohort were African MBAs from Oxford, Stanford, MIT, and the other half were brilliant young Africans who hadn't left the country. Uh, this was specifically in Kenya, who tried to start a business, who, who'd applied to 10 jobs, you know, three applications for each open role, who you could tell had that hunger and that ability but didn't have the opportunity. We put them together uh, on a, a, a program that was synchronous and asynchronous. We brought in all of the kind of top uh, tech talent and, and investors from the continent to do Ask Me Anything sessions. Um, and you know, four of them have landed in funds and we hired uh, a fifth. And that was off of our first cohort of 13. And, and we're not the only ones that are thinking about talent development on the continent. Of course, it's selfish in some way because we'll have kind of fantastic young Africans working across the continent who will love us over the next kind of 10, 20 years, um, but also they're going off, you know, like TLCom has someone, uh, BFA Global has someone, like the, they've all gone in, 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 and it's going to kind of develop it. And it can't happen right away. You can't come into a market and say, okay, local fund managers go. Um, there needs to be this knowledge transfer, right? They're talking about kind of fractional talent, which uh, that fantastic question slash comment uh, slash pitch, uh, you know, was, was, uh, was, was helpful to understand. And, and we've seen one more point, We've seen a company, a Nigerian company, fantastic business. I just want to talk about the growth. They, they started transacting last September. They've done over a billion dollars of transactions already. That's not the interesting part. They're struggling with talent. So they've set up an office in the Netherlands and they have a CTO from the Netherlands and they're saying one week. Can someone turn that down, please? Thank you. They're saying one. Oh, that's the fire alarm. Yeah. The fire alarm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe you're talking too long. No, yeah, I, I, I was sure. It was. <laughs> it's just. No, go ahead. Oh. Do, we, do we need to worry? Yeah. No. It's, it's a test. Oh, it's a test. It's, it's a, a test. test. That's a perfect day for a test. Yeah, perfect day for a test. <laughs> I was convinced exactly. that it was going on way too long. I'm going to talk over the fire alarm. Um, and so, what this business has done is they've established an office in the Netherlands and they've given their Nigerian talent one week a month to go to the Netherlands, and that is attracting and retaining exceptional. I've seen that look before from teachers, I'm sorry. And they have been able to retain exceptional technology talent, and there's this transfer element. Uh, so they're, 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 yeah, so that's just kind of one solution. Thank you. So Richard, I, I, I do have one, one uh, person it's here. A it's a real question. And it's actually <laughs> I think we've done over a time. <laughs> Just a real question alert. Yeah, yeah. I think they're mentioning, right, like, um, employers that are eligible who don't find that they are, yep. to find professors. So, I run an SME in Nigeria. Um, I, I can't hear. Can, 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 can you hear? So, yep. where do you find companies to invest in? So, where should I, where should I appear? I mean, Pleasure. listen. Okay. The, did, did you hear the question? Can you maybe, for the audience, just repeat the question? Yes, yeah, so she was... She, She's a female-founded business in Nigeria. She was asking where we find business and where we find pipelines since it's not yeah. at the Marriott Bar in downtown Lagos at 8 o'clock on a Thursday night, right? So, I mean, listen, and this goes to the, to the talent question. We're not a fly-in, fly-out expat model. What we're doing unsecured lending. It's my team on the ground that, that drives the success or failure of my business, right? And so talent is an issue. But and I, I have teams that hustle, right? They, like, pipeline is not a desk job for them, right? And so we try to meet founders where they are. We know where the co-working spaces are. We know where the networking events are for, for founders. We know the bank loan officers that are rejecting their loans, right? We know which churches have Wednesday night meetups for people trying to start businesses in the food and beverage space, right? So I think you've really got to understand who your market is, who you're trying to invest in, and meet them where they are. And so I'd love to talk to you afterwards about where you hang out. <laughs> okay. None of those places. <laughs> so I need to change my social life. All right. 
Well, uh, Richard uh, is, is looking at me as if this is indeed we, the end. We've run it. way over time, and all I can do is hope that you're as hungry to invest as you are for lunch. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to thank Olivier and his panel for, for some very useful thoughts. And um, thank you again for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.